Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you to Supersonic and uh, to Dr. Sakai for the wonderful introduction and for the wonderful evening at the planetarium. Um, and thank you to Dr. Lee for uh, having so thoroughly covered many aspects of liver elastography. Um, the liver is kind of an international organ. Uh, we have them in America too. So some of the information that I'll be covering today is uh, similar to that that Dr. Lee has spoken about. But there's some additional information that I'd like to speak about uh, which really pertains to uh, bringing liver elastography into your practice in the United States and how you might use liver elastography in your own clinic and how you might deal with your hospital and hospital administrators around issues with actually implementing a technology that uh, is uh, in, an, in an evolving stage of uh, regulatory approval. So <clears throat> I'll start with my disclosures. Um, I have uh, some grants, uh, NIH grants, some grants from the AIUM, the Mass General Hospital, and the ARRS. Uh, Supersonic Imagine has uh, supported my attendance at the RSNA this year and has supported uh, our research work with equipment, as is General Electric, Hitachi, Toshiba, and Siemens. Now, what I'm going to try to cover today in this talk is an overview of diffuse liver disease in the United States. And for most people here, that's uh, diffuse liver disease in your clinical population. I'm also going to try to speak about what diseases are really the targets for non-invasive assessment, because not every disease is necessarily a major target for this technology. It's also important as a practical ultrasound leader to understand that there are certain things that your hospital administrators want to know uh, when you're planning on implementing a new technology. And in fact, the first thing that I was asked for uh, two years ago uh, was the business case. Why do I think this will be useful and what kind of difference will it make to my department? And at the end, um, I'm going to discuss the results of the diffuse liver disease shear wave elastography that we've done at the Mass General. So we've seen a similar slide earlier. Um, I think that the key thing to realize is that chronic liver disease is a disease that has a variety of causes, but actually a final common endpoint. And the liver, when injured, regenerates itself and fibrous tissue is deposited. The pattern of fibrosis varies across the different causes. But with all chronic liver diseases, there is a stable, well-known pattern of evolution that begins with fibrosis and that ultimately ends up with cirrhosis. And it's really important to appreciate this because Cirrhosis, by definition, is an irreversible stage of fibrosis. Treatment doesn't or barely help cirrhotic patients. The only real treatment for a cirrhotic patient is liver transplantation, which is enormously expensive. But liver fibrosis in the intermediate stages is actually treatable, and for many diseases, the progression to ultimate cirrhosis can be stopped. So when we look at our target diseases in the United States, uh, the first disease that's the major disease worldwide is chronic hepatitis B. There are two billion people in the world who are infected with hepatitis B. That is about 40% of the population of the entire world. In the United States, there are fewer, but there are one million people. That is a very sizable number of people in the United States. And of course, mainland China has a vast number of people with hepatitis B. Hepatitis C is probably the single major current target disease for liver elastography. And the prevalence in the United States is quite remarkable. The prevalence of hepatitis C in the United States is about 3 million. And that is remarkable because hepatitis C has a 20% lifetime risk of progression to cirrhosis. What that effectively means is that there are two to three million people who have a 20% chance of ultimately developing cirrhosis. And unsurprisingly, hepatitis C is currently the major cause of patients needing liver transplants in the United States today. The thing that's remarkable about that is that hepatitis C is currently a treatable disease. 
The treatments are toxic and or expensive, but you can treat it, and in the majority of patients, you can stop the progression to cirrhosis if you make the diagnosis. And the numbers are quite remarkable when you think about them. 5% um, of people who have, uh, who have cirrhosis will ultimately die per year, and 4% of them will develop cancer. Uh, the benefits to society of preventing cirrhosis are enormous. The last disease that's been alluded to by the prior speakers is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And the numbers for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease are simply remarkable. Uh, about 30% of people in the United States have fat in their liver. Uh, a lesser proportion of those have non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, maybe 10 to 20% of those. That's an incredibly large number of people, perhaps 9 or 10 million people. And this is, again, a major cause of cirrhosis in the United States. And it is treatable. It's treatable with diet and blood sugar management. But once again, it's only treatable if you make the diagnosis. And once you've treated it, you need a mechanism to monitor progression of the disease and the efficacy of treatment. So some, some little facts about HCV that really put it in context. And the treatment for HCV is toxic and expensive. Uh, new drugs are currently going through the approval process. Uh, the major regime, the new drugs are very expensive but less toxic. The well-validated regime consists of about 40 weeks, 24 to 40 weeks of subcutaneous interferon therapy. Uh, subcutaneous interferon is incredibly expensive. About 10% of patients develop major depression and actually can't finish the course of interferon. About 2 or 3% of people in long-term interferon actually commit suicide because of major depressive disorder. It is expensive and dangerous. And as you'll remember, as I said earlier, that about 20% of the people who are infected with hepatitis C will ultimately go on to develop cirrhosis. Now, what that means is that 80% of the people who have hepatitis C won't go on to develop cirrhosis. If you were to treat everybody with interferon, you'd be treating 80% of the people who don't need to be treated. So the challenge, their challenge in hepatologic practice is to identify the 20% of people who need to be treated. And at the moment, that's done using a technology that we're all very familiar with. That technology is called liver biopsy. And uh, what we do is we look for moderate or greater fibrosis at the time of diagnosis. And that tells you that over the person's lifetime, they'll probably go on and progress and develop cirrhosis. So here's some information that's, uh, I think, already been covered about liver biopsy as an imperfect reference standard. And if you look at the images on the right side of the screen, uh, what you'll see is the patterns of fibrosis that occur in the liver. And it's quite remarkable, really, because you can see small nodules of cirrhosis, of fibrosis, and these then coalesce, and bridging fibrosis appears, and subsequently cirrhosis. You can imagine that when you place a biopsy needle inside this liver, you could really easily put the whole biopsy needle into one of these nodules and get an artificial impression that this patient has a much greater or higher stage of cirrhosis than they actually do. And that's one of the key advantages of really all of the non-invasive techniques, which is a reduction in sampling error. So when you look at the, the data for liver biopsy, firstly, it's pretty expensive. Um, I don't have it in the slide here, but a, a liver biopsy costs on average about $3,000. And an abdominal ultrasound is typically reimbursed at a rate of $150 to $200 in the United States. The second thing is that liver biopsies cause pain and anxiety and discomfort. They cause death in 0.01%, which uh, doesn't sound like a very high number until you recognize that there are three million people out there in the United States who could conceivably need a liver biopsy to stage their disease. And of those three million people, one in 10,000 might die as a result of their liver biopsy. So that's a very, very large number of people. And a very, very large number of people who could benefit from having a non-invasive test. So how do we... Um, how do we go about um, establishing a situation where there's actually a demand for a, a non-invasive marker or a surrogate marker of liver fibrosis? And, uh, you know, I call this, uh, this, this is the business case slide, or, you know, why, why do you want to buy another ultrasound machine? Um, in, in my practice, we have 30-something ultrasound machines across a variety of vendors, 
And uh, I, went, I went to the hospital administration to say there's this great new ultrasound machine that I think can do this. And uh, that, was the, that was the question I got, why do you want to buy it? And um, I said to them, well, I thought patient care would be better. And they said to me, well, we provide pretty good patient care as it is, and uh, the evidence isn't very strong. What's the business case? What, what, what actually makes sense? And I think this is a, a very important thing for many radiologists who work in hospital practice in the United States, is to realize that there is in fact a legitimate business case for liver elastography that has nothing to do with actual reimbursement for liver elastography. And I set about developing this and uh, did an analysis in our practice. We do about 10 to 12,000 abdominal sonograms per year, upper abdominal sonograms. And of those, uh, around about 250 had the clinical history of question mark cirrhosis. Does this patient have cirrhosis? Um, 250 sonograms per year over a period of five years is almost the purchase price of an explorer. We also do 400 non-focal liver biopsies per year, and many of those biopsies, those $3,000 biopsies, could probably be replaced with $150 um, abdominal sonograms. So in putting out a, a business case for actually installing uh, uh, shear wave elastography, I discovered that in fact uh, the, there is no need for a distinct CPT code or billing code at all. In fact, I was able to get to a business case for the uh, installation of an explorer in my hospital quite easily just using the likely increment in abdominal sonography, not to mention the fact that patient care would be better. And um, our hospital find this found this persuasive, and uh, we replaced our research explorer with a clinical explorer uh, some months ago. Now, it's important to realize that the explorer is not the only uh, ultrasound technology out there. There are competing technologies from other vendors. There are also other surrogate fibrosis markers. There are serum biomarkers. There are non-invasive imaging-based methods. And the serum biomarkers really are a plethora of different uh, markers of collagen turnover in the blood, as well as indirect markers like liver function tests. And they all suffer from the same basic problem, which is Processes occurring in other parts of the body, and even in the liver, like hepatitis, confound serum markers, and it makes them fairly difficult to interpret. Um, I think they will have a role, but they can be hard to interpret. They've been extensively validated for hepatitis C, but they're unable to detect early liver fibrosis, and as I pointed out before, they have a variety of clinical syndromes that confound them. Um, in the imaging modality side, as our prior speaker alluded to, uh, the conventional imaging with ultrasound, CT, or MRI, specificity is great. The problem is sensitivity is just absolutely terrible. And of course, you primarily are able to diagnose liver fibrosis when it's cirrhosis and when it's entirely irreversible. So from a clinical perspective, the vast majority of conventional anatomic imaging is basically useless. MR elastography. I think it works. It works probably just as well as shear wave elastography does. Of course, it costs a, a multiple thereof, 20, 30 times as much, and is simply not accessible to the vast majority of patients. Once again, we have 3 million people in the United States with chronic hepatitis C, and uh, not even the American healthcare budget can withstand uh, MR elastography in 3 million people. So we're left with real-time shear wave elastography, and as people have seen before, this is what it looks like. Uh, we've acquired measurements in a variety of locations in the liver, but tend to acquire them superficially in the right lobe through an intercostal approach. And a region of interest is placed within a, a color box, and uh, then data is obtained. Uh, previously in kilopascals, I understand now in meters per second, but essentially the data point is much the same. It's a continuous measurement that you then use to uh, you superimpose a cutoff on that in order to diagnose a particular stage of uh, fibrosis. And a uh, similar slide to what people have seen before, uh, there has uh, recently been a change in the uh, FDA approval status of the Explorer, and in fact now the scale, uh, this is for clinical non-research units in the United States, the scale comes preset such that the uh, color scale is optimized for the expected range of uh, 
velocities that you might see per organ. And in the liver, it's optimized to show you the range between normal liver and cirrhosis and permit you to correlate with the adjacent color scale to obtain a, a kind of uh, visual assessment of the degree of fibrosis in the liver. Now, uh, we've studied this at the Mass General. We're up to about 200 patients now. I'm reporting on uh, the 110 patients whose data we've analyzed. Uh, we started out using the 3.2 version software, and now we're using 4.2. And uh, with blinded review, we do Metaver, ESHAC staging, steatosis grading, and multiple sites. We also, take bio we also take images directly at the biopsy site and then do post-processing. And this, this report is, covers a variety of liver diseases, uh, 55 subjects with 35 hepatitis C's, uh, autoimmune disease, alcoholic liver disease, hemochromatosis even, and other patients for the evaluation of elevated liver function tests. And you'll remember, as I said before, that the patterns of liver fibrosis vary across the different diseases. So it's likely that these patients with chronic liver disease that probably closely correspond to your own patients are not giving you results as clean and as tidy as you get in single disease studies, but the results are very interesting. So when you look at our patient group, um, as I said, 110, an average age of 49 years, evenly distributed between males and females, this is pretty typical for a standard American group of chronic liver disease patients. And again, a wide distribution across the different F stages in the metaverse staging. And what you see is an area under the receiver operating characteristic curve of 0.98 for the diagnosis of cirrhosis, and that 0.98 directly addresses the 250 referrals that I get every year saying question mark cirrhosis. And then uh, an area under the curve of 0.72 for diagnosing moderate or, greater cir uh, moderate or greater fibrosis. And that is really quite a remarkable result in my opinion because we're comparing this to extant imaging technologies that have no accuracy or validity whatsoever for this. And we're able to classify a substantial number of patients across a wide range, really the full range of liver disease that you might see in American practice. We're able to classify them into moderate or greater liver fibrosis in a significant proportion, which is a remarkable result. So some conclusions. Um, SWE is a, a very promising new tool. It's, it's actually remarkable that the tool is as young as it is because it represents such a, a leap, such an increment in our capacity to do something that we couldn't do before. And as the technology evolves, I think that it's going to become integrated into the basic workflow of every patient, every patient with chronic liver disease because the advantages over liver biopsy are completely obvious. And in many institutions, including ours, uh, a rational business case can be made without any billing codes. Thank you very much.